You are looking at a piece of history. The first photo taken by a camera aboard a reconnaissance satellite. It shows Ms. Schmidt airfield in what was then the Soviet Arctic. The photo was taken on August 18, 1960 by a camera mounted on a satellite called Corona. By today's imagery standards, the photo looks fuzzy and distant. Yet it was of great value because it was the first, one of many firsts for the Corona Satellite Reconnaissance Program. began under utmost secrecy. The Air Force, specifically its Ballistic Missile Division, would be responsible for the development, launch, and operation of the spaceborne vehicle as well as recovery of the payload. The Central Intelligence Agency would be responsible for developing and procuring reconnaissance equipment and selecting the targets for imaging. The Corona program was envisioned to be a series of satellites that would carry cameras to photograph denied areas Launched into polar orbits by four boosters, the spacecraft would fly at approximate altitudes of 100 nautical miles and take pictures of selected target areas. The exposed film, returned to Earth in capsules ejected from the satellite, would be snatched in mid-air over the Pacific Ocean and airlifted to processing facilities. Contractors would play leading roles in turning plans into reality. ITech Corporation would design the spaceborne camera. Lockheed Missiles and Space Corporation would develop the upper stage and service integrator for the entire effort. General Electric would design and manufacture the recovery capsule. And Eastman Kodak would furnish a new film designed to operate in the unique environment of space. By May 1960, the Corona program was well underway. There had been 11 launches, none of which had achieved mission success. Then, an incident occurred that added urgency to the mission. The shootdown of a U-2 flight over the USSR on the 1st of May. With aerial photography now denied the nation, the United States urgently needed an alternative. And Corona became that alternative. While the program began as an interim, short-term, high-risk effort, it far exceeded early expectations and would deliver, as history attests, better quality and more plentiful photo reconnaissance than the U-2. Corona was not an instant success. The first 12 launches were failures for various reasons. The causes were multiple and ranged from launch vehicle misfire on the pad to failure to achieve orbit. And there were instances when, having achieved orbit, the satellite actually entered an incorrect orbit. There were improper capsule ejections and camera failures. And perseverance paid off with the success of the 13th launch publicly announced as Discoverer 13 on August 12, 1960. This flight, designed to test the recovery vehicle, had no camera aboard. The vehicle was successfully launched, orbited, and deorbited. The only hitch was with the capsule splashdown well away from the planned impact point. Fortunately, a recovery helicopter reached it in time before it sank. While less than perfect, it was another first for mankind. The recovery of a vehicle from space. One week after the Discoverer 13 water recovery, Discoverer 14 achieved full success. The vehicle carried a 20-pound load of film. The camera worked perfectly, and a full load of film was exposed and transferred to the recovery capsule. Ejected on the satellite's 17th pass, 
The film capsule was successfully snatched in mid-air by an Air Force C-119 aircraft. Just 110 days after the U-2 incident, Corona had made a quantum leap in intelligence gathering by operating from the new high ground of space. 3,000 feet of film were acquired on Discover 14's historic flight. More than 1,650,000 square miles of Soviet territory had been photographed for interpretation, providing more coverage than all of the U-2 missions over the Soviet Union throughout previous years. Data like this helped build confidence in the measures taken by our national leaders to counter the growing Soviet threat. Constant technical improvement was a hallmark of the Corona program. Industries, designers, and engineers were continually challenged to improve the program's capabilities. Early missions used acetate-based film, which crumbled and jammed repeatedly in the spaceborne cameras. To solve the problem, Eastman Kodak developed the capability to coat a high-resolution emulsion onto a polyester base. This new polyester-based film could withstand the vacuum condition of space. And in later improvements, it was made thinner, permitting the spacecraft to carry more film, thus increasing mission duration. 145th and final Corona launch took place on May 25th, 1972. Having achieved its purpose, Corona's existence is now unclassified, and its artifacts have been made available to the Smithsonian Institution so that others might gain a sense of how far-reaching the program's unsung heroes were in their pioneering efforts. The camera and two buckets from Corona's last flight will be part of a permanent exhibit at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Team members who made up the Corona program can take just pride for their achievements in intelligence gathering, as well as their scientific and technical contributions. They have compiled an enviable number of lasting firsts. The first use of a satellite to gather photo intelligence. The first mid-air recovery or catch of a re-entry vehicle. The first mapping of the Earth from space. The first gathering of stereo optical data from space. The first use of multiple re-entry vehicles. The first space reconnaissance program to fly 100 missions. Corona was the prototype for follow-on photo reconnaissance programs. An unmanned spaceflight endeavor that provided leading-edge technology to future manned spaceflight. As the program resulted in scientific and technical achievements, Corona also served as the model for a new organization, the National Reconnaissance Office, bringing together the best talents of the CIA and the DOD with design, build, and operate Corona's successors.